year series of uh, uh, public lectures uh, hosted by the uh, Center for Mathematical Sciences and Applications at Harvard. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, Dan Spielman. Dan and I uh, have known each other for a very, very long time. Uh, many of you probably have heard about his recent resolution of the Cadison Singer conjecture, and that's probably what makes him the most famous person now. But five years back, it was this analysis of linear systems that made him the most famous person around. Before that was the analysis of smooth analysis for linear programming. Even before that, it was linear time error correcting codes and uh, decoding algorithms. Before even that, he had work on holographic proofs. And way before you were all born, and shortly after he was born, he even had this wonderful work on complexity classes called PP, which is close under intersection. So his research truly spreads, uh, you know, spans a huge spectrum. Uh, his awards have been trying to catch up with this, uh, with this, but they're somewhat, sh uh, you know, short of the, the current target. But he's already awarded the MacArthur Prize recently. Before that, the Nevelina Prize, and God knows what all awards and so on. And I'd rather not tell you about all of these, and instead let's turn over the uh, podium to Dan and listen to him about uh, solving Laplacian systems on, uh, on graphs. Okay, and welcome to Dan. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So I, I told this. I was told this was a public talk. I'm not sure exactly what that means. <laughs> But um, to me, it meant I should talk about the work that I'm most comfortable talking about in public. Uh, so uh, I'm sorry I'm not going to talk about Caddis and Singer today, which is actually something I usually think is for more a private, refined audience. Um, though it looks like that's what I've got here today anyway. So um, you saying that we're not refined? <laughs> yes, no, I wasn't sure what public meant in Cambridge and who was going to be here. Um, but uh, let me begin by saying, ask me questions anytime during this talk. I'm ready for that. So my main goal is to tell you something about Laplacian matrices of graphs. And I will try to begin by telling you why we study them and some of the applications in which they appear. I will eventually tell you what those matrices are and then tell you about some of the algorithms we have for manipulating them and some of the cool things that we can do with them. And about 40 minutes from now, I'll explain that picture. So my plan is first to introduce some of the applications that excite me about Laplacian matrices, how they enable us to solve problems of interpolation on graphs, which I'll explain, how they were used classically to model resistor networks and spring networks, how that enables us to get some of the first interesting algorithms in graph drawing, graph clustering, and then some of their more interesting recent uses in linear programming. So those are the applications I'll tell you about. And then I will tell you about some algorithms for sparsification and for solving systems of linear equations in Laplacian matrices. And these are sort of enable us to deal with Laplacian matrices very quickly. And that's part of why they are then useful in all of these applications I told you about in the first place, because you can actually do them. So first, let me tell you about this result of Drew Garamani and Lafferty that uh, they talked about in the context of manifold learning. But I think of it as supplying an algorithm for interpolation on graphs. So you imagine that I have a graph where this is an example of protein-protein interaction network. A small toy example, but it was from a bigger one. So every vertex here is a protein. And I've drawn an edge between two of them when they are known to interact in some way. Now, biologists measure which proteins interact with which others in all sorts of different ways. Um, there are experiments. There's data. Let's not worry about exactly where that came from. But we should remember this might be slightly noisy. OK, now imagine you know something about some of these proteins. For example, you've done some experiments, and you've determined that one of them, like ANAPC10, is involved in some disease of interest. So if it is involved in that disease, we'll mark it a 1 for yes, it's involved. And imagine I've determined that CDC27 is not involved. So we'll mark a 0 for that one. OK, so I now know perhaps that some protein is involved in the disease and some isn't. And I now want to investigate the others. So to figure out which ones to investigate, I probably want to estimate what is the probability that these other proteins are involved in the disease. So what that means is. I want to assign you know, a real number to each of these other vertices. 
And assuming that nodes that are neighbors in the graph and have an edge joining them or interact might be similar, you could say, I don't want these numbers to vary too much across the edges in the graph. Well, the way Drew Garamani and Lafferty suggested measuring this is they measure the sums of the squares of the differences across the edges. OK, so to fix notation, letters like A and B will denote vertices of a graph. The pair AB is an edge. X is, you can think of as a function that assigns real numbers to every vertex, or think of it as a vector. It assigns a real number to every vertex. And they say, we want to figure out what is X at every single node. They say, let's minimize the sums of the squares of the differences across edges subject to the known values. So this is the solution you would get here. Now, this object, the sum of the squares of the differences across edges, is going to be the main theme of this talk. This is the Laplacian quadratic form. There is a matrix called the Laplacian matrix, so that you can write this Laplacian quadratic form as x transpose Lx, where the rows and columns of L are indexed by the vertices. Let's, we're going to worry about what L looks like later. To begin, I just want to worry about the quadratic form that it defines. Uh, that said, one reason we do worry about L is if you actually want to do that minimization, well, you know the minimum will happen at the place where all of the partial derivatives are zero. So if you take derivatives, you find that in order to compute the minimum, you need to solve a system of linear equations. And this is a system of linear equations in a Laplacian matrix, or properly speaking, in a submatrix of the Laplacian. And that's one of the reasons we want to solve systems of linear equations later. OK, so let me just review the Laplacian quadratic form of a graph. Again, you're given a graph. The Laplacian quadratic form takes as input a vector that assigns real values to the vertices. And then it tells you how smooth is that function across the graph. So it tells you what is the sum of the squares of the differences. So here I've given you a graph, a vector on the vertices, and the squares of the differences on all the edges. I should mention, you can also put weights on the edges if you want. And at least positive weights. Let's not think about negative weights. If you put negative weights on, there are different ways of doing it. One of them yields a mess. So let's just think about putting on positive weights. If you have positive weights, you just put the correct positive coefficient in front of that quadratic term for that edge. And you can absorb that into the Laplacian as well. OK, I'm going to give you Two more examples of places where Laplacian quadratic forms come up that hopefully are fairly understandable. But if you get questions on it, if there's something I forgot to say, just remind me or flag me and tell me. OK, so the first, or one of the first places people studied Laplacian matrices was in analyzing networks of resistors. Um, and they'd have a network of resistors and think of it as a graph. I like to go the other way. I like to take a graph and think of it as a network of resistors. So I think of each edge in the graph as being a resistor. In this case, I imagine they all have the same resistance, let's say resistance 1. And then one way I can try to analyze the graph and understand it is by imagining what happens when I try to flow electricity through the graph. So a natural experiment I can do is I can take two vertices of the graph and attach them to the terminals of a battery, say it's 0 volts and 1 volts. And then you can um, try to think of compute what are the voltages induced at the other vertices, and how much current flows, and where does the current flow. And that tells you something about the relation of those two vertices to each other, at which we put the terminals of the battery. So physics tells us that the induced voltages should minimize that Laplacian quadratic form, the sums of the squares of the differences across the edges, subject to the boundary conditions. The boundary conditions are that uh, that node is at 0 volts, and that node is at 1 volt. Uh, the reason is roughly the energy dissipation in terms of heat going across the edges is given by that square for each edge. And physics tells us that's what's supposed to be minimized. OK, so this is actually the exact same. Oh, by the way, these are the numbers in this graph that minimize that. This is the exact same thing that Drew Garamani and Lafferty were doing, except um, they did it in machine learning. Uh, therefore, you can get very large grants to do it. I don't know if you can get a very large grant to analyze what a resistor network will do. Um, that's not fair to Drew Garamani and Lafferty. That there's a lot else in that paper. Um, and it's yielded some good results. OK, so let's take a look at this electrical flow. There is more to it than just getting the induced voltages. 
We do have those differences across edges. And if you remember from physics, this rule V is equal to IR, you can figure out how much current will flow across those edges. So we get more than just induced voltages. We get a current flow on every edge. And you can look at how much current flows. This gives us a very useful measure in a graph that's called the effective resistance between those two nodes. What that is, is it tells you if I imagine the entire network just being one complex resistor between those two nodes, which it is, what is its resistance? That's what we call the effective resistance. Using the rule V equals IR, you can say the effective resistance between those two nodes is the reciprocal of the amount of current that flows when you put one volt there. So the more current that flows, the better connected those vertices are, the lower the resistance. Ah, that's one thing to remember when you're applying weights, and you can put this with resistors in. Very high resistance means you have a very weak connection. Infinite resistance is no connection. So high resistance corresponds to low weight. Similarly, low resistance corresponds to high weight. Anyway, so this sort of tells you if I treat the entire network, it's just one complicated edge between those two vertices. What weight should I assign it? Effective resistance tells you that. And this is a way of measuring how well connected those two vertices are. That's a little more subtle than just asking, is there an edge between them? Or if there is an edge between them, what is its weight? Or how far apart are they in the network? Sort of the more independent short paths you have between those two nodes, the lower the effective resistance will be. Okay, here's the other physical model I like to talk about, spring networks. So here, you think of every edge as a spring. Now the spring constant in Hooke's law is the weight. Um, and there's a natural experiment you can do. Again, you can nail down the positions of some of the vertices and see where the others are going to settle. And again, physics tells us that when a string is stretched to length L, the potential energy should be L squared over 2, and that the nodes should wind up in the positions that minimize the total potential energy. So physics will tell us that the ventral position of the nodes will minimize, again, the Laplacian quadratic form subject to the boundary constraints, which are where we've nailed those vertices into the board. But now, again, once you go to this model, you can suddenly do something a little more interesting than you can with electrical flow. When we're talking about electricity, I had zero volts and one volts. Here, I can put these vertices anywhere. I can put them into two, in two dimensions or in three dimensions. I can fix those vertices anywhere and see where will everything else settle. This gives us one of the first really interesting algorithms for graph drawing. So this appears in this beautiful 1963 paper by Tut called How to Draw a Graph. So the way to think about it is you start out with some graph, and I imagine it might just be a jumble of vertices and edges, and pick some nice feature in the graph like a triangle. Okay, here's a triangle in the graph. Then let's take the vertices in that triangle and move them to the outside of the picture. And let me nail down their locations. And let the edges now act as springs. Let this settle. It'll bounce around for a while. Tut proved that if the graph is planar and three connected, this gives you a planar embedding of the graph. So it needs to be three connected just to avoid some degeneracy conditions of everything going to a line. It's like a necessary thing to avoid. But other than that, if this is planar, this gives you a planar embedding, meaning there are no crossing edges. Now, you can't necessarily see that in this picture because I drew my vertices too big, and there are a bunch of them that clustered up. But we can do this differently. You can modify this. Um, you can start not with a triangle, but with any face. So here, are, let's say I pick a quadrilateral face and move that to the outside. And if you nail that down and let everything settle, this eventually will get us a much nicer picture. And again, if you want to make your picture even nicer, in theory, you could do so by adjusting the weights of your springs and things like that. So this is like one of the first really amazing results in graph drawing. Now, to me, this theorem is amazing for two reasons. One, uh, because it's true. I mean, why should springs care about my very human desire to draw pictures of graphs without crossing edges? I don't know why. But they do, and they do it for us. Um, the other thing that's really amazing to me is that Tut proved this back in 1963. So if you know me, you know that before I would ever prove a theorem like this, I would have done a million examples to check that it was always true. 
And before I had the confidence, I'd probably to go and prove it. I'm pretty sure Tut didn't have that in 1963. Now, I should just say pretty sure. I was at Waterloo maybe a year ago, and they told me that they found you know, notebook after notebook of examples that Tut had drawn by hand. So he'd clearly worked out a large number of examples before going ahead and proving it. OK, so that is my motivation for the Laplacian quadratic form. Let me tell you something else I like to do with them. Um, I told you there's a matrix there. And again, in a moment, I will tell you what the entries of the matrix are. It's important that we can make L a symmetric matrix. And I'm sure you all remember that whenever you have a symmetric matrix, um, it has n eigenvalues. One of the great things about symmetric matrices, we can find n real eigenvalues and orthonormal eigenvectors. And shockingly, these tell us a lot about a graph. So I mean, I remember when I first learned this, I was sort of amazed that eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a matrix associated with a graph should have anything to do with the graphs, combinatorial properties that I like to study. And I don't think I have time right now to tell you too many examples. But let me at least convince you that it has to be true. And that, I think, will suffice for now. So the way I will show you this is by using these eigenvectors to draw a graph. This is uh, from a paper of Hall from 1970. So Hall sort of says, imagine you have a graph like this one. This drawing is not that informative to me. So we're going to draw it by computing eigenvectors. So remember, the Laplacian matrix, the rows and columns are indexed by vertices. So if I compute an eigenvector, an eigenvector gives me a real number for every single vertex. Well, if I want to draw, I need two eigenvectors. So here's Hall's spectral graph drawing. We don't care about V1, the eigenvector of the smallest eigenvalue, because it's the constant vector. Constant vectors, things are the same at every vertex, are not very informative. We compute V2 and V3. Again, V2 and V3 assign a real number to every vertex. So what I did here is I drew, say, vertex 7 at V2, the seventh coordinate, an eigenvector 2, is it gave me the x coordinate, and then the y coordinate I got from V3. And then the edges, I just drew a straight line. So the eigenvectors give me locations for the vertices. And this is a beautiful picture of this graph. Now you can ask, how often does this happen? The answer is very often. Meaning, if someone comes into my office, as sometimes happens, and says, Dan, I have this graph. Can you tell me something about it? Um, this is the first thing I try. It doesn't always work, but when it does, it's just amazing. If you get a beautiful picture of their graph, they're like, oh, thank you. Now I know what that graph is. Um, so here's an example. It's one of my favorites. Um, this is the famous airfoil mesh. So how many of you have seen the airfoil mesh before? Can I get a show of hands? OK. Few, well, some of you in a talk of mine, probably. But if you're a MATLAB user, it's, a, it, it's one of their default examples. So type load airfoil, and you get this graph and coordinates for the vertices. So this was used for modeling airflow around an airplane wing, and that's a cross-section of the airplane wing. So um, right, this graph comes with the adjacency structure and the coordinates. To produce this picture of it, we drop the coordinates. Just take the adjacency structure, just take the Laplacian matrix, compute the second and third eigenvectors, and use those as locations to plot the vertices. And you get this picture, which is really nice. And I think that has to at least tell you that this can't be an accident. These eigenvectors know something about the graph. And actually, let me show you how nice it is by zooming in on a portion of it. If we zoom in up here, it's like it's planar up there. It's beautiful. Um, actually, as a matter of fact, if you look at this image, it is not a planar drawing of this planar graph, but if you, it really decomposes into sheets that occasionally bend over each other. Yes, Boaz, you're thinking. So, uh, uh -huh. If you looked at, uh, say, eigenvectors, uh -huh. number, I don't know, instead of uh, two and three, yes. or three and four, or something like that, what, what happened? If you look at three and four, it looks like you took this graph and you bent it over itself twice. Well, three time, twice in one direction and three times in the other direction. So it's sort of like you projected it onto some piece of paper, and then you bent it around a few times in space. But I can't bend it two ways very easily and then project down. Um, that is my empirical answer. I have no theorem to explain this. Um, I've been asking people for 20 years for a theorem to explain this. Uh, um, there's some that are getting closer. I mean, probably the 
the right theories probably come from people studying discretizations of PDEs. Yeah. So no, Hall did not really prove a theorem other than he set this up as an optimization problem and then showed that the minimum is achieved by the eigenvector. So he's, he actually doesn't, he talks about this as here's an algorithm for how we want to decide where to place certain vertices and then observes the eigenvectors give the solution. Um, and I don't remember if Hall used the word Laplacian or not. It might have been before his time. Okay, and of course, not everything can be drawn nicely in two dimensions. Like, take the dodecahedron. If I take the one skeleton of a dodecahedron and do this with it, I get what looks like a squashed dodecahedron. Um, that's because I've actually done something wrong. If I take a look at the second smallest eigenvalue, lambda 2, it has multiplicity 3. Meaning, I shouldn't be taking v2 and v3. I should be taking v2, v3, and v4. And I should be plotting the dodecahedron in three-dimensional space in front of us. And then you get exactly what the dodecahedron is. And really, when I, picked, when I said I want two eigenvectors from a three-dimensional eigenspace, I made an arbitrary choice of which two it was, or my code did, and just projected the image down. And this is true for every platonic solid in any number of dimensions you want and some other generalizations of them. You take the eigenvectors, the lowest dimensional eigenspace, you, space, you get an embedding of that solid in the correct dimensional space. Um, and again, some things aren't meant to be drawn. So this is um, a network I took from Paul Erdős's co-authorship network. So I took a look at every paper Paul Erdős should wrote. All of his co-authors are vertices. Um, I drew an edge between two of them when two of them co-authored a paper with Paul Erdős. The graph is not connected, but it does have a very big connected component. I drew that large connected component. Still not a great picture. Okay, that's fine. I mean, some things y you can't draw. You can't expect to draw everything. But even when you can't draw a graph, Laplacians can help you. So when I can't draw a graph, what I like to do, usually, sorry there, is um, find clusters in the graph. At least try to discover some sort of organizational structure to the graph. So the way we find clusters, or we define them, there are various ways of defining clusters, I should warn you. But usually what they do is you look at a set of nodes in a big graph, and you look at something like the edges on the boundary. The edges going from inside the set to outside the set. And you usually want there to be not too many of them. Now, you have to say not too many relative to what? Usually to something like the number of vertices inside the set. So you might divide by that. Or the number of edges inside the set. There are different ways of setting it up. Um, but all of them are related to the Laplacian. So the reason is the Laplacian quadratic form lets us measure the boundary of a set of vertices. So if I take the characteristic vector of the set of vertices, it's a vector that's 1 inside the set and 0 outside the set, and plug that into the Laplacian quadratic form, I get the size of the boundary of the set S. I mean, the reason, of course, is because you take a look at the sums of the squares of the differences of this function across the, ver the edges. And for the nodes that are outside, they contribute 0 minus 0 squared, nothing. The edges that are inside, you get 1 minus 1 squared. They contribute nothing. And the edges going from inside to outside give you 1 minus 0 squared. OK, that's 1. So you get 1 for every edge on the boundary. Oh, and if we have weights on edges, this counts the size of the boundary measured by weight. So you get the sum of the weights of the edges on the boundary. This observation leads to a very powerful set of heuristics for finding clusters and graphs that are called spectral clustering and partitioning heuristics. Uh, some of you here are experts on these. So in essence, what the spectral clustering heuristics try to do is try to find a vector x. It should be a characteristic vector, but we can't start there. We want to find a vector for which the Laplacian quadratic form is small, but x is somehow reasonably big. And a great way to start is to compute the second eigenvector. So you compute v2. Let's say that assigns a real number to every vertex. And the way you make a set out of this is you look at the level sets. So you pick like the, all the vertices. In this case, my set is all vertices for which v2 is more than point, uh, 0.7. And it turns out that, OK, rounding all of those to 1 and rounding all of the others to 0 gives you a reasonable 
cluster. Actually, you can prove that. So Cheeger's inequality, properly interpreted, tells you that this algorithm gives you an approximately optimal cluster. If you measure the quality of a cluster by what we call conductance, which is the number of edges leaving divided by the number of edges inside the set, then Cheeger's inequality says that this is an algorithm that gives you at least a quadratic approximation of the best possible cluster. Okay, now I'm going to finally tell you, wow, a half hour into my talk, I think, I can tell you what the Laplacian matrix of a graph actually looks like. We've been talking about the quadratic form all this time. By the way, uh, the reason I push this very late into the talk is, uh, one, it doesn't help our motivation, but two, when I first learned about Laplacian matrices, I was told what the entries were, and it's always a matrix that looks like this, and then was told to, you know, given a homework problems, and I had to prove things about it. And all of those proofs were hard, unless you knew what the Laplacian quadratic form was. And if you knew what the Laplacian quadratic form was, then all of them were easy. So this is why I'm trying to write the world by putting the quadratic form first. And then the matrix, eh, you know, it's useful, but we'll do it later. Okay, so here's what the matrix looks like. Um, for e the matrix has non-zero off-diagonal entries. They're negative when there are edges in the graph. So for example, that blue edge up there between node 2 and node, si node 6, corresponds to the minus one in row two and column six. It's a symmetric matrix, so we also get a minus one in row six and column two. Where there are no edges, we have zero, and the diagonals are the weighted degrees of the nodes. That means the diagonals are set just so the sum of the entries in every row and column is zero. So the diagonals can be positive. Um, and of course, if I had weights on the edges, then the weights appear in the off diagonals, negative. So we can prove that. I'll prove it, tell you what the proof is. It's not hard. Um, recall that we can write the Laplacian quadratic form as a sum of terms, one for each edge. Well, what that means is we can really take the Laplacian and write it as a sum of baby Laplacians, one for each edge. So I will let LAB the, be the Laplacian matrix for the graph that just has edge AB in it and nothing else. So we can write the Laplacian as a sum of those. And what those look like, well, here's the Laplacian for the graph with just edge 1, 2. It only has nodes 1, 2, but you know, you can pad with zeros to put the others there. It looks like 1's uh, on the diagonal, minus 1's on the off diagonal, and the reason is that's the outer product of the vector 1 minus 1 with itself. And the vector 1 minus 1 is what you need to multiply x by to get x of 1 minus x of 2. So that gets you the appropriate square, and that's how you can prove the Laplacian matrix has this form. Okay, so the reason that I'm telling you about all of this stuff is, a, I want to say, a little over a decade ago, Xiong Hua Tang and I wrote a paper that gave very fast algorithms for solving systems of linear equations in the Laplacian matrices, at least in theory. So the running time of these algorithms was order m, where m is the number of non-zeros, that's good, you want to be time proportional number of non-zeros, times some power of log n, where n is the, no, the dimension, times log one over epsilon. They're getting you an epsilon approximate solution, and I will tell you what that means in a minute. But think of something that's right, epsilon close to the right solution. So this is a nearly linear time algorithm. That's usually what our goal is, is to come up with nearly linear time algorithms for things. Um, but that's maybe a difference between theory and practice. Whether or not this is good really depends on that constant C. Now, in our initial paper on this, we used well, three tools. One was a graph partitioning algorithm, which we used to make do something called graph sparsifiers, I'll tell you about in a moment. We used low stretch spanning trees, and when you put all those tools together, that constant C was something like 80. So that means it was completely impractical. It's nothing you could ever use. You know, log n to the 80 is too big to contemplate if, n, if log n is not 0 or 1. <laughs> Once it's 2, that's bad. Thankfully, in the years after we wrote this paper, people improved all of these tools. And this constant just kept dropping. Until an amazing paper of Kudis, Miller, and Pang, which got that constant down to one. So one where they were able to get rid of the sparsifiers, they put in some random sampling, they used better constructions of low stretch spanning trees other people created in a, just a really simple, and it's not only a better running time, it's a simpler algorithm. And it got time to order m log n, 1 over epsilon. Other people are going to wonder, what is that O tilde hiding? It's hiding a log log n. 
I hope you will excuse me for not writing the log log n. But I want to get rid of it. Anyway, it, but that is really fast. And I thought we were done at that point. Until a few years later, Cohen King, Pachuki, Peng, and Rao got the constant down to a half. OK, so think about this. this. If you want epsilon to be a constant, which you usually do in most applications, then this is like m root log n time. That is asymptotically less time than it takes to sort the non-zero entries in the matrix. And you can get approximate solutions to systems of linear equations in that time, asymptotically speaking. Now, if we're not asymptotically speaking and we care about what actually ha you can do, there's some pretty good code out there. Uh, there's code called the Lean Algebraic Multigrade by Levin and Brandt. There's the Combinatorial Multigrade written by Kudis before that paper. Um, so it was before that technology was available. And um, I have a package called Laplacians.jl. And I will tell you at the end of this talk a little about the algorithm we implement there. It's called Approximate Elimination by Rasmus King, who I saw sitting here a moment ago. And I lost track of where he is there. Thank you, Rasmus. Um, anyway, we have a variation on that. But I implemented. And I'll give you some comparisons at the end. But you can solve these quickly. Yes? What's solving a Laplacian equation? Sorry. Oh, so let's say I want to solve Lx equals b. So in the Laplacian matrix. But really, the right way of saying what is solving a Laplacian equation is something like I nail down some vertices. And you want to figure out where all the rest of them are going to land to do graph drawing. That is what solving Laplacian lets you do. It also lets you compute very quickly the eigenvectors of smallest eigenvalue. So if you want to do spectral graph drawing or things like that, the fastest way to get those eigenvectors is by doing something like log n solves with a solver like this. Um, otherwise, the large eigenvectors are pretty easy to get, but the low eigenvectors solving, because you're really doing power method in the inverse, and this is the right way to get at that. So this basically tells us you can do things with any, almost anything you really want, rationally with Laplacian, we can do really quickly now. That's part of why I made a package out of it, to make it easier for people to do it. OK, I should just briefly mention, what do I mean by an epsilon approximate solution to a system of linear equations? It's almost what you'd think it should be. So if I want to solve Lx equals b, my epsilon approximate solution is some vector x tilde, which should be close in norm to x. Let's not worry about the actual norm I choose yet. Um, the idea is the difference between x tilde and x should be most epsilon times the norm of x. That's sort of the right way of scaling things. So the odd thing you'll notice here is that I'm not using the standard Euclidean norm. I'm writing this in terms of the matrix norm. So the matrix norm of a vector is just the square root of v transpose LV. Or I think it was the norm of the square root of Laplacian times a vector v. Now you're wondering probably why the heck am I working in this funny norm? It doesn't look intuitive. Uh, I was wondering the same thing at one time when I started reading the literature in numerical linear algebra. Because if you read the papers in numerical linear algebra, this is how the guarantees look. This is sort of what is natural from the algorithms that people produce. But actually, more importantly, if you are going to use Laplacian solvers as a subroutine in something else, this is how you want to measure your error. So a lot of times what we want to do with Laplacian solvers is we use them as a subroutine in something else. And then if you, you know, you're going to solve to some error, you want to figure out how does that error play with your, your next application. Almost always, this is the right way to measure your error, to plug it into the next application. And Alexander Madri is the one with the next applications who will hopefully testify to this if we ask. Or hopefully at least won't disagree with me, because there could be cases I don't know about yet. Um, but this is how you want to do it. So this is why, OK, so it's a little bit of extra work to understand a slightly more complicated norm. But it saves a lot of pain later when you're trying to understand how approximate solves play with every other application you're using them for. So let me tell you about some of those. One of my favorite ones are how Laplacians arise in solving linear programming problems that are naturally defined in graphs. There are a lot of natural linear programming problems, which if you solve by an interior point method, you know, many of you may know interior point methods give you ways of solving linear programming problems. But what you might not know is that at every step, the interior point method is solving a system of linear equations. And it's a nice system of linear equations if your problem is nice. 
And if your problem resides on a graph, usually the system of linear equations is either a system in a Laplacian matrix or something that's very close to a Laplacian matrix. So that means you can speed up interior point methods by looking inside this black box, not just using a linear solve or backslash or whatever it's using. You replace the linear system solver as we're doing with the Laplacian to the Laplacian solver and you can make things faster. So at the moment, the fastest asymptotic algorithms for many problems go through this route. So like the fastest algorithm for maximum flows and min cost flows is by Alexander Madri and goes this route. The fastest algorithm for computing shortest ST paths goes this way. Now, okay, you're wondering probably why is shortest paths a problem? Allow yourself to have both positive and negative edge lengths. If you can have both positive and negative edge lengths, you can't just use your standard, you know, growing approach to shortest paths. And the fastest algorithm by Cohen, Madri, Sienkowski, and Vladu runs this way. By, with a custom built interior point method. They can't just use the plain old interior point methods. They need to tweak it a little. And isotonic regression, which is a classic problem from statistics. And I had a paper with Rasmus King about Lipschitz learning. It's something when we want to regularize. Uh, it was related to the problem I gave you initially of Drew Garamani and Lafferty of doing interpolation on a graph, but with a somewhat different objective. And it allowed us to tolerate noise in both the uh, edges of the graph specifying where they were and in the values you were given. And actually this is one of the things that really motivated me to try to implement Laplacian solvers well was in order to do the experiments for that paper we needed to solve some linear programs that were fair and actually even worse somewhat that were fairly involved. And this was the right way to do it. Okay so let me just show you roughly how this looks for the maximum flow problem. So can you get a show of hands for how many of you have seen the maximum flow problem before? Okay. All the computer scientists and probably a few people who haven't. Okay, so, uh, but rough, just to remind you, usually you have a graph with edges and they have some capacities for how much stuff they can transmit and you want to ship as much stuff as you can from a source vertex S to a destination vertex T. So you set this up as a linear program. You want to maximize how much is coming out of node S subject to some constraints. Uh, one of them is for every node, the flow in is equal to the flow out. And the other is that, uh, wait, so those are equalities. And then you have inequalities, which is for every node, the amount of flow should be positive, but less than the capacity. So if you see what an interior point method is doing with this, oh, by the way, here's the solution for this graph. Okay. What an interior point method is solving many problems of the following form. The same graph, just changing weights. And the problem is it wants to find some flows. They need to satisfy flow in is equal to flow out constraints. Um, and the flow out of S is the flow into T is the same. That should be the amount we flow. And they want to minimize the sum of squares of flows across edges so, times some weights. It turns out that we can also turn into an electrical flow problem. So this problem that they solve, you can solve by solving a Laplacian system. And just what the interior point methods do is they keep solving these systems just with different weights. Uh, roughly, my cartoon in my mind, I don't know if I can make it rigorous, is I think about you solve this electrical flow problem. The electrical flow problem doesn't know anything about your capacities. It just gives you some flows. And when things are above capacities, well, we just increase the resistances on those edges so that it will want to send less along those edges. That's the cartoon in my mind. I, I mean, Alexander and I were at one point able to make this somewhat rigorous, but it's not exactly, it's never exactly landed up to my, or lived up to my cartoon, let's say. Okay, and as I mentioned, uh, for things like um, min cost flow, this now gets you the fastest known algorithm. So min cost flow, you're not just trying to compute a flow, but among all the flows that send a certain amount, you now have cost for edges, and you want to say minimize the cost. This is the fastest asymptotic algorithm. Um, I guess the chain of work, depending on which regime you're looking in, is, comes from work of myself and Deitch, or Madri, or Lee and Sidford. And I'm working on an implementation prog project with Kimon Fontalakis and Anup Rao. We think this will actually be the fastest algorithm for min cost flow in practice. Max flow, the code is sufficiently optimized. I don't think we can win. Uh, min cost flow, I think, there's at least a large fragment of large problems where I, uh, expect this will eventually be a win.
Um, but it does take making some improvements in the interior point methods, because when you take a look at the best interior point methods, they're usually fairly optimized, and you can't just take their code and swap out the linear equation solver. Um, not, or at least it's not painless. Okay, so I've told you a lot about what Laplacians can do for us. Now let me tell you about what we can do for Laplacians. So the first tool or I want to tell you about is spectral sparsification. So sparsification is the approximation of a graph by a sparse graph. Let's think by one with few edges. And what we know is that we can take every graph and approximate it by one with not too many edges so that their Laplacian matrices are similar. Let me say what I mean by that. Um, I will say that a graph H is an epsilon approximation of a graph G. If for all vectors X, the Laplacian quadratic form in H is approximately the same as the Laplacian quadratic form in G. When I say approximately the same, I mean divide one by the other. It's less than one plus epsilon and at least one over one plus epsilon. And when that's true, I will write LH is an epsilon approximation of LG. So there's a very, there's a very strong notion of approximation. Um, for example, we know from our earlier examples that if two graphs approximate each other this way, then for every single set of vertices, they have approximately the same boundary where you measure it by weight. So what's going on here is when you have a set of vertices, you might get rid of many of the edges, but now they have higher weight. And their sum will be approximately the same for every set of vertices when you have this approximation. It also means it's almost, it's a few line proof that if one matrix approximates another this way, then their inverses do as well, or pseudo inverses for the Laplacian. So this means that solving systems of linear equations in one matrix are similar to the problem of solving them in the other. Or in particular, if I get a solution to a system in H, it's an epsilon approximation of the corresponding solution in G. All right, that is less obvious. But by the way, I defined epsilon approximation earlier. That's the right thing you would get out. So this can help us design algorithms because we can deal with sparser graphs and then presumably sparser graphs take less time to deal with. <clears throat> it also tells us that all effective resistances in the two graphs are similar. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we sparsify graphs, but let me first convince you that it should be possible to some degree. So I think your first case you should check is can you sparsify the complete graph? I mean, the complete graph has all possible edges. So it turns out the best approximations for the complete graphs are expander graphs, in particular Ramanujan expander graphs. Okay, I can get a show of hands for how many of you have seen expanders before. Cool, Ramanujan expanders? Still pretty good. Okay, so okay, this is a great audience. For the few of you who don't know yet, well now you know you should. Um, expander graphs are incredibly useful in computer science. Um, they have, they think of them as like random graphs. For now, they have many pseudo-random properties. One property they have is that every set of nodes has a large boundary, so all your boundaries are big. The second eigenvalue is big. Ramanujan graphs are characterized by lambda 2 being as large as possible. Random regular graphs are usually pretty good expander graphs. So here what my cartoon at the front showed was the complete graph and a great approximation of it, which is the Peterson graph. Um, that is my best small expander on 10 vertices of degree 3. And notice I made the edges a little thicker to indicate you have to increase the weight on them. There's sort of a conservation of mass going on. When I want to approximate one graph by another, I want the weighted degrees of every node to be about the same and the sum of the weights of the edges. So I just make them a little thicker. Okay. We don't quite have something like random regular graphs, but many of you know, you know, erdos renyi graphs, once you get to degree log n, give you good expanders. Well, we can also generate sparsifiers by random sampling. So the idea is you give me any graph, and we're going to assign a probability to each edge. I'll call it PAB. And then what we do is with probability PAB, we include the edge. 1 minus PAB, we don't. If we include an edge, we increase its weight by dividing by PAB. What that means is that every edge is included at least in expectation with its original weight. And if I make a Laplacian like that, it means that the Laplacian of the resulting graph in expectation, if you're not used to expectations of matrices, just think you need it to hold entry-wise. But the expectation of the Laplacian is then the sum over all edges of the probability we include it times the weight if we do, that PAB and the other PAB cancel, we get the Laplacian of the original graph. So if you do any scheme like this, 
will at least get you the right Laplacian and expectation. The only question is with what probability and how close and you do have concentration. Well, it turns out that the right probability to choose to sample every edge is its weight times the effective resistance between its endpoints. So you remember I defined the effective resistance at the beginning of the talk as one over the current flow when you put one voltage difference between the endpoints of the edge. So here some of the current will flow over the edge, but some goes around the edge and goes other ways. The more current that goes other ways, the less we need that edge. And accordingly, the lower probability we will sample it. Um, also, if you take a look, I mean, to really make this proof work nicely, you need some matrix concentration bounds. While we got the intuition from effective resistance to this, if you take a look at matrix concentration bounds like Rudelson or Alshweed and Winter or Trop's paper, it turns out that right, you know, really this PAB times the weight is the, I mean, the effective resistance times the weight is the optimal choice for those bounds. So that optimizes those bounds. And this gets you a sparsifier with order n log n over epsilon squared edges which is pretty good. It's not as good as an expander, which was like constant degree, but this is close. Yes? I'm curious, is there yeah. a sort of constructive way to do this that doesn't require knowing W already when you do this? Oh, if you don't know the weight, you need to know the weights of the edges, certainly, to do it. So like there is no, if you don't know the weights, you're in trouble. There's nothing that'll work without that, unfortunately. You can't sample some weights. Oh. I don't think so. Because one of the problems is if they're very high weight edges, you can't afford to miss them. So you at least would need to, pref you need to prefer the high weight edges. Otherwise, you, right, there, you can make examples where this can fail. I should say, still you can do better than this. Well, at least we do have constructions with fewer edges. So you can get rid of the log n term here. So, you can prove that for every graph, G, there is a graph H, which is an epsilon approximation. And the number of edges in H is at most, well, basically read this as 4n over epsilon squared, for at least epsilon small. And that's pretty darn good. That is less than twice as many edges as the Ramanujan expanders need to approximate the complete graph. Um, by the way, we still don't know if anyone can do any better. I've been wondering for a long time if you can fix that factor of 2. Um, the reason it's a hard problem is to say that factor of two, you need to use something very special about graphs. And I will admit that this theorem uses nothing about graphs. It really just uses some facts about matrices. It's purely linear algebraic. But those facts about matrices you won't improve, but maybe for graphs you can. You know, probably because Ramanujan and graphs exist, you probably can, but I, I don't know how. And I should mention this. Um, existence proof had an algorithm, but there is now a nearly linear time algorithm by Lee and Sun, which gets you something that is almost as sparse. So you can do that pretty well. Okay, I want to finish the talk. Oh my gosh, I'm running all on time by telling you about approximate Gaussian elimination. Um, so this is this algorithm that Rasmus King and Sushant Sachdeva came up with for solving systems of Laplacian equations, which is almost as good as the best algorithms, and is really, really simple and incredibly fast. Let me try to explain it to you. So let me recall what Gaussian elimination does. I got to begin with that. So because not everyone learns it the same way. So Gaussian elimination, we usually describe as computing a lower, uh, turns it for, sorry, for a symmetric matrix, I'll say it computes an upper triangular matrix U, so the Laplacian is equal to U transpose U. Uh, people I know usually describe this as LL transpose, but L is a Laplacian, so I can't use L for lower triangular, so we're going to use U, it's upper triangular. Um, they compute in their approximate Gaussian elimination a matrix U, so that U transpose U is approximately equal to the Laplacian. <coughs> So to tell you how they do that, first let me give you the right view of, additive view of Gaussian elimination. Usually we're taught it multiplicatively. You think of row operations and multiplying by matrices. But really there's a nice additive view, which is the right way to apply the tools of random matrix theory. So let's do Gaussian elimination on this matrix. So what we do is we first find the rank one matrix that agrees with it on the first row and column. Oh, good. That works on this projector. Here, so I take a look at the first row and column. 
Find the rank one matrix that agrees with that. I, you can see it's rank one because I'm writing it as a vector times its transpose. Now that I've done that, subtract that off. That corresponds to like Gaussian elimination of the first row and first variable. We are left with another matrix with one, you know, zeros now in the first row and column. Find the rank one matrix that agrees with that on the next row and column. Here it is. And hey, it's, we're good, making progress. It starts with a zero, okay? Subtract off that rank one matrix and keep going. And when you're done, what you've done is you've taken your matrix and written it as a sum of outer products of vectors with themselves and zeros increasingly appearing, more and more zeros per vector. This is what Gaussian elimination does. I want to point out right now that the running time of this is proportional to the sums of the squares of the non-zeros in each of these vectors. The amount of time it takes, say, to subtract off one of those outer products is proportional to the number of non-zeros squared, because that's how many non-zeros there are when you take the outer product. So the time of Gaussian elimination comes from these non-zeros. To make it faster, we need to put more zeros in there. Oh, by the way, to get my lower triangular times upper triangular matrix, I just take those vectors and assemble them together, the columns. That's my lower triangular matrix and my matrix U is its transpose. So that gets you U transpose. Okay, so we are going to use, we're going to do the same thing, but with some random sampling in order to get a sparser matrix faster. And there's one really important thing I need to tell you about Gaussian elimination of Laplacian matrices. Laplacian matrices are closed under these row operations. So if I take a Laplacian matrix and I subtract off the rank one matrix that agrees on the first row and column, the remaining matrix is still a Laplacian. That is a very important property that we wind up exploiting. So we keep getting Laplacians. Here's the other thing. In the graph, what you can understand is that when you eliminate a node, you wind up getting rid of it, but then you create or add in a clique on its neighbors. So when I eliminate a node, we create a clique on its neighbors, but we don't want to build that clique. Writing it out would take a while. Um, what King and Satch David do is when they create that clique, instead of creating it, they sparsify it. And because it has a nice closed form and implicit description, they don't ever have to construct it. They can create a, construct a sparsifier for it without ever needing to construct it. So they're going to replace it by a sparsifier. And it's a really nice randomly chosen sparsifier. So let me just tell you, when you eliminate a node of degree D, they wind up putting D random edges between its neighbors. So they eliminate a node of degree D, they put in D edges, so the number of edges doesn't grow. And they can, there's a very, very simple rule for choosing them. Basically, each node chooses one neighbor with probability proportional to the weight of the edge connecting it to that. OK, I don't have time to say all the details, but I'm going to say it's simple. You can implement it. If you implement it, your code won't work unless you do two very special things. Uh, one of them is you need to replicate the edges before you begin. So they begin by actually making log n squared copies of every edge. After they do that, then the procedure I described works. Oh, and you need to randomly permute the vertices. Yes, Alexander. Do you need to do that? Or do you need to prove um, You need to at least have log n, it, it seems, and you need to randomly permute. There are bad orders. Yeah, we don't know, I don't know if you need to randomly permute, but there are bad orders you could go through. Which is interesting. Um, so that gets you time order log m squared. I will tell you that. I don't think I say it here. Um, OK, so in this Laplacian's JL package, I implement a sort of heuristic variation on this, which um, doesn't seem to need to permute. We have no theory yet, but we also have no counterexamples yet, and it works pretty well. So let me just mention Laplacian's package is meant to do a lot of these things that I told you about. One of the most useful things it has is some tricky graph generators. Um, so since I'm running low on time, let me just tell you a few experimental results and finish. So you can compare this to other algorithms. Now, what you compare on, in your, which matrices you care about, really affects how your algorithms do, right? So one of the first things people try is grid graphs. So if I try a 1,000 by 1,000 grid, approximate elimination solves it to like eight digits of accuracy in 6.3 seconds. 
combinatorial multigrid is three seconds, lean algebraic multigrid is 15. Those are the one algorithms I usually like to compete with. Those are the ones that are really pretty fast, you know, so it varies. Try 100 by 100 by 100, 3D, pretty similar. You can ask, what about a random four regular graph? Well, here, um, our algorithm is slower than those other two. That doesn't bother me that much. Random regular graphs are really the identity. Algorithms like conjugate gradient, which is really simple, really outperform that. So everyone's going to lose to conjugate gradient on those graphs. Um, you can ask about preferential attachment graphs. Uh, we're somewhere around the middle. LAMG is winning on those, but there's a very old heuristic called incomplete Cholesky preconditioners. Those win on preferential attachment graphs. Uh, those were the workhorse of scientific computing for a long time, but on some of these other graphs, they do horribly. Okay, I told you I have a generator, this thing called Chimera, which makes very tricky graphs. I used to break my code. Uh, unlike this Chimera, you find that our algorithm took uh, 2.5 million vertices. Our code took about 28 seconds. Here, CMG died, taking 350 seconds. Um, you start to worry about these things when you're running a loop and you start calling another algorithm many times. You start worrying about its worst performance rather than its average performance often. Because sometimes it's really bad. Well, maybe you care about its average performance, but as you say, the average performance is dominated by some extreme examples. So here's an example that came up solving min cost flow problems where we found examples where their LAMG sometimes took forever. I, the one that stopped after 60 seconds, because at some point once it takes more than 10 times as long as my code, I just got to kill it. Um, uh, you know, otherwise you wait forever. Um, so what is the summary? Approximate elimination reliably handles somewhere between 300 and 500,000 non-zeros per second, if you want eight digits of accuracy. The other algorithms vary a lot. If you have a particular application, you should try you know, try all of them. But at least this one is reliable enough for us to use as inner loops and like interior point methods. OK, I now really want to just mention a few other recent developments. Um, there are other families we can solve. Uh, you can have complex weighted Laplacians instead of ones minus ones, or even have matrices there that are orthonormal matrices. These are called connection Laplacians. Um, and I've been spending my spring break, by the way, writing code to solve those systems quickly. Uh, I think I finally got it working right last night. We'll see tonight. Um, a very recent development was handling Laplacians on directed graphs. We can now solve those systems of linear equations quickly, at least in theory. Why do you care about this? If you have a random walk and you want to figure out the stable distribution, there was no non-trivial algorithm for doing that before these papers, which is shocking because we've been setting random walks forever. Um, but there was nothing other than basically, you know, Gaussian elimination to find the stable distribution of a random walk. Or, anyway, these can do that in nearly linear time. And if you want to find more, well, I have a web page uh, with a lot of notes. I have class notes from courses on this stuff related to spectral graph theory. I recommend very highly the theses of a lot of people who've worked in this area, who've written very nice expositions on this material, and the book LX equals B by Nishith Vishnoi. Thank you.